Chapter 1 The camp circle was on the move again. Whenever one side wore out and became unsanitary, or whenever it was time to go elsewhere to hunt deer or to gather the fruits in season, the magistrates, whose duty it was to think and plan for the people, ordered this move. And at such times, everyone must obey. To remain behind was to be without protection. The day was oppressive, hot, and heavy. The air was filled with dry dust that rose only so high and then hovered there, enveloping and moving with the line of march. Fine dust continually stirred up by the feet of humans and animals and by the ends of travois poles that scraped along behind pack horses. Uphill and down dale, the column crawled, picking its way over the trackless land. The young wife, Bluebird, could scarcely sit her horse another instant, oh, to dismount, but the kinship rule of avoidance kept her silent as long as it was her father-in-law who walked ahead leading her horse. At last, mercifully, he handed the rope to his wife and dropped behind to walk with a friend. Now I can speak. She too is a woman. She knows how it is with me. But even then, Bluebird waited as long as she dared before saying, Mother-in-law, let me get down. I must walk. Very well. If you must, you must. But say when you want to ride again, the older woman replied, then adding, sighing, Ah, child, we do you wrong to travel today, but try to bear up. Already we have made the three stops, so the next will be the last. It can't be far now. That was all. The respect customary between two persons in their relationship made them hesitant to discuss freely the cause of their mutual anxiety. Bluebird stepped out of line and walked along beside it, determined to keep up, but she fell steadily behind, and soon her mother-in-law, who continued in line, was far ahead, talking to herself. It is my daughter's-in-law's own concern. If she wishes to walk more slowly, that is her right. It was not for her to question her son's wife, as though doubting her common sense. But she consoled herself with the likelihood that there would be relatives back there who would be with the girl if she needed help. And so, with shaky optimism, she plodded on, trying not to worry. And now the line was moving along the crest of a ridge, still at the same snail's pace. Far ahead, the four magistrates, who always led the moving camp, walked with the peace pipe extended continuously, before them in propitiation of the Great Spirit. It was they who set the pace, always bearing in mind the aged and the infirm, the women with burdens on their backs, and the short-legged children who trudged along beside them. As for the men, they were out on scout duty. All able-bodied men and all responsible boys were on horseback, convoying the column. Some rode far ahead of it and others far behind, while still others were spaced along the line on both sides. They kept out of sight, so the line seemed to be moving alone, but actually they were ever on guard, one or another of them dashing out to some distant peak from time to time to scan the country beyond. Bluebird looked about in her anguish. Over at the left, where the ridge fell sharply away, she saw the tops of trees. That meant water, or seclusion at least. She must go now, right now. She dared not wait another instant, for this was her hour. Turning aside, she walked swiftly and disappeared over the slope. But her going drew neither attention nor comment. Decency compelled adults to leave the line and go temporarily out of sight whenever it was necessary. Only small children, and sometimes the very aged to whom nothing mattered much any more, were not so scrupulous, nor were they expected to be. The Tetons were a modest but also reasonable people. On the young girl's brow stood beads of sweat icy cold. Against the spinning world, she struggled to think coherently. Just what was it her grandmother once told a woman? Something about the best position to induce an easy birth. Or was it a quick birth? What was it anyway? She groped for it in her confused mind. Suddenly it came like a flash. And with it, something else the grandmother once said. No woman cries out like a baby. People ridicule that. To carry a child is an awesome thing. If one is old enough to bear a child, one is old enough to endure in silence. Bluebird clung to those words with desperate tenacity and allowed not a moan to escape her. Though she was alone, 
An eternity passed, and then the child was a girl. Of that she was vaguely aware as she picked it up from the soft grass on which it lay, and fumbled for her knife, in its case hanging on her belt. Cleanly and quickly she cut the cord, as old wife said it should be cut. She herself had never beheld such a thing. Unmarried, young women did not witness births. Still dazed, she wrapped a child in a fawn skin, which she had prepared in secret, working it long hours at a time to render it white, pliable, and soft. She had kept it with her against this hour. Next, she changed into a fresh gown, wrapped the placenta and cord in the discarded one, and tied it in a neat bundle. Then, stretching with superhuman effort, she settled it securely into the fork of a tree, well beyond the reach of discriciating animals. You should always do this, for every newborn child, that it might grow up straight-limbed and clear-minded. Everyone knew that. It was the ancient law. At the water's edge, she knelt to wash her stained hands. Then, hardly knowing why, she rained a few drops gently on the little face that fitted nicely into the hollow of her hand. But, try as she would, she could not concentrate on the wonder she held there. All around the water lilies in full bloom seemed to pull her eyes to them irresistibly, until she turned to gaze on them with exaggerated astonishment. How beautiful they were! How they made you open your eyes wider and wider the longer you looked, as if daring you to penetrate their outer shape and comprehend their spirit. She glanced from one to another, and suddenly... It was impossible to distinguish them from her baby's face. A new sensation welled up within her, almost choking her, and she was articulate for the first time. My daughter, my daughter, she cried, how beautiful you are, and as beautiful as the water lilies. You too are a water lily, my water lily. She sobbed with joy. Shocked by the cool water, the baby struggled vigorously, moving her head quickly from side to side, and then... Wonder of wonders, she looked up at her mother and smiled. Bluebird was certain of it. Forthwith, Bluebird forgot every care, even her unhappy life with a foolishly jealous husband. Pressing her baby against her heart, she rejoined the line. With supreme effort, she retained the composure and the placidity conventional to women, for even her lingering pain itself a pleasure. Her return to the group attracted no special attention. After all, Young women with babies in their arms were the rule rather than the exception. Moreover, the people near the end of the line were not the ones who had seen her leaving it earlier. By now the sun hung low. Looper walked quietly alongside the line if, as if looking for her people. Until a woman who was a social cousin noticed what had happened and took charge of her. After sending her family on, she turned her pack horse out of the line and settled the mother and child on the travioli seat behind and began leading the horse at an even slower walk so that its delicate burden should not be jolted by hidden bumps and stumble. They pulled into the new camp circle at dusk. Everyone else had arrived and swung into position. Some teepees were already up, and others were rapidly being erected all around the circle. The men and boys who had ridden all day to guard the people now appeared at their teepees, gladdening their wives or mothers with such small game as they had come upon. Soon an unbroken ring of campfires twinkled in the glowing darkness, and pungent smoke rose like incense from every hearth. Camp life was readily assumed after a march. Increasingly, Bluebird felt her weariness. She was grateful when her cousin invited her to stay until she should regain her strength. "'You have been through much today,' the cousin said." It is not easy to give birth on the march. Stay here with me and let me take care of you. I will do the work and cook the food while you feed your baby and rest. If you were to go home now, you would feel you must work. News traveled fast around a camp circle, from teepee to teepee, and in no time at all it completed the circuit. When Bluebird's mother-in-law heard the baby had come and that the mother and child were safe in a cousin's teepee across the common, her relief was boundless. Early next morning, she came to see them and heartily agreed her daughter-in-law should remain where she was for a time. To her simple mind, for she was not a very imaginative woman, this seemed an ideal arrangement at first. It was not until she was halfway home that she found herself muttering, My son will not like this. He will be angry that his wife does not come directly home with the baby. 
and she began to dread telling him, not knowing how ready he was to misinterpret whatever Bluebird did, and knowing, too, how ill-tempered he had always been, and how, for most, he had grown since this gentle girl became his wife. It was a disturbing thought.